Time Error, welcome to Stupid Ancient History, Stupid Error Level Greeks, and today we're going to look at the reasons for Xerxes' failed invasion. So, the reasons for Xerxes' failed invasion is one of three prescribed debates for the course, the other two being causes of the Peloponnesian War in 431 and reasons for Athenian failure overall. As with the other videos we've done in this series, this is intended really as kind of an overview guide. It's a look at the big issues, sometimes that can get lost in all the detail. This is no replacement, we should say, for close study of the sources, the period, and the actual texts. For prescribed debates, however, even though you don't necessarily need to know or cite secondary scholarship on these views, uh, it's always a good idea to try and read some of these uh, and get a better understanding of it. Hopefully, well you'd hope a professional academic would explain their viewpoint or their perspective better than I can in what's hopefully going to be a 30 minute video. So let's get started. As with anything in history when you're looking at causation there's always a number of reasons that come into play for any given event, be it the failed Persian invasion or anything. Um, usually these work in a combination. Now when we look at Xerxes' failed invasion there are a lot of different things we could use as reasons for why. So we're going to look at them one by one and we're going to look at them in this order. So the main reasons we're looking at are reasons to do with Persian leadership, reasons to do with Greek leadership, uh, the classic kind of comparison of the armies, hoplites and immortals, the importance of Athenian naval power, the commitment that's demonstrated on either side, the logistics and the terrain of Greece, and finally, luck, because that had quite a big hand in it as well. Yes, it seems like there are a lot, but I am going to try and be brief. Uh, think of these kind of as audio-visual bullet points. There will be further information behind these that obviously you'll pick up from the text and the sources. Um, and if you think I've missed something off, uh, leave me a comment and I'll do my best to correct it. So then, let's get started. And the first main cause we're going to look at, the first main reason for this failed invasion, uh, ultimately has to be Persian leadership. It's hard to explain this defeat, this epic failure, without looking at Persian leadership. Um, and in this, for what we're looking at, we're really looking at military leadership. We're not going to look at kind of Xerxes and his preparations necessarily. We're going to look primarily at how the Persians commanded their armies, how they demonstrated leadership or lack of uh, in terms of military leadership. So what happened when they actually went to war and came to lock horns with the Greeks? So your obvious starting point for Persian leadership is obviously going to be with Xerxes. Um, obviously Herodotus emphasises the role of individuals in his work, but with someone like Xerxes, this all-powerful god-king, it's hard to just dismiss him. So Herodotus' portrayal of Xerxes in battle is definitely not a good one. Um, a classic example of his lack of leadership, we see he's, we're told he repeatedly is leaping from his throne in dismay at the Battle of Thermopylae. He sees his armies failing to dislodge these few Greeks and he just leaps from his throne in dismay, in anger and just starts screaming into the wind. Um, clearly not the best military commander you'd want organising a battle for you. Similarly, we see a, a lack of understanding with the events at Salamis, when particularly with the instance of Artemisia turning, ramming into one of the Persian ships and on a way out, Xerxes' belief that this is his side winning really shows that Xerxes, despite everything he's been taught to do, everything he's been brought up to do, everything he's wanted to do, when push comes to shove, he is not a skilled military commander. He doesn't really have a good grasp of what's going on in these battles. Um, we see that again from Herodotus's portrayal it seems that Xerxes is unable to think in battle. When things start to go wrong and we see the examples where he starts to panic and he can't he can't think on his feet, he can't adjust his plan to try and dislodge the Greeks in whichever conflict we're looking at. He simply cannot adapt. 
Um, again, this is Herodotus. We've got to be wary of his coverage here. We've got to remember it is the Greeks writing about a Greek victory and even though we can suggest Herodotus is quite gentle to some Persian leaders, Xerxes as the man who invaded within Herodotus' lifetime does get painted as this kind of kicking, screaming, almost inept general. But even if we bear in mind Herodotus's kind of natural Greek um, bias, ultimately where, whether or not he is this kind of god king, we're clearly presented with a man who is not a skilled military leader. He is not good under fire, he is not good under pressure, um, he's not used to things not going his way. So clearly this is a real issue when we look at Persian leadership, the fact that he is the man in charge, he's led his army that he has built into Greece, but once he gets there he's unable to adapt to those pesky Greeks fighting back. Ultimately he just wants um, the Greeks to submit. Clearly that's why you bring this massive army, he's hoping that as they roll across Greece the Greeks will simply fold. Where the Greeks do not fold, though, this is where everything starts to fall apart for Xerxes. Because he's the man in charge, he can't just delegate power, and he really is not up to the job. So that's a clear reason for Persian failings. Saying that, though, it is probably just a bit too harsh just to blame Xerxes, even though, again, we said Herodotus emphasises individuals. And because of this, it's a little hard sometimes to unpick the flaws in Persian leadership outside of Xerxes, because again, don't forget, Herodotus is a Greek, he's got limited access to what would have happened in the Persian camp, um, so it's easy for him to just write it up as Xerxes. Where we do see some coverage of the wider Persian leadership, though, it really does expose some serious flaws. Um, it's kind of systemic flaw, and it's partly due to the nature of Persian society. So if we look at this idea of wider Persian leadership, where we do see military discussions, for example, before the invasion where Xerxes is warned not to go, or particularly prior to the Battle of Salamis, it seems that there are very, very few voices of dissent. It seems Xerxes realistically is surrounded by a bunch of yes-men, for want of a better term, um, a bunch of lackeys who simply agree with him. There are a, a few notable examples. Uh, prior to Thermopylae and at various points throughout, we see Demaratus, the exiled Spartan king, who Xerxes has got as an advisor, does give him some quite stark warnings about this is not going to go how you think, the, particularly before Thermopylae, when Xerxes is told of the Spartan preparations. He's quite clearly told by Demaratus, this is not going to go your way. This is not going to be as easy as you think, regardless though Xerxes carries on. Um, probably even more notable than Demaratus is, of course, Artemisia. Um, prior to the Battle of Salamis, as Xerxes is coming up with his great military strategy, um, she clearly warns him not to send his fleet into the Straits of Salamis. She's quite clear on this saying that if you push your large Persian ships into this narrow channel, you will basically become sitting ducks for the much faster, nimbler, more agile Greeks. Xerxes basically ignores her, um, as do most of his men. I mean, again, with Artemisia, we've got to be very careful. She is the queen of Halicarnassus. She's a bit of an unusual character anyway. Um, and of course Herodotus is from Halicarnassus, so this is probably a bit of a hometown hero for him. Um, it may be that he emphasises her role or her wisdom, but even still it portrays this theme that we see in Persian leadership, that the majority of Xerxes' officers seem to simply go along with his will, with his plan, despite some garish, gaping flaws in this. I mean, one reason we could suggest this is it seems that within Persian society and within the Persian military, we see the promotion of officers to particularly these high levels more due to the kind of their aristocratic background rather than their military skill. 
um, we get the idea that his Persian commanders are simply there because he owes them or they are relatives of them. We've got good examples. So if we look at way early on, not necessarily in Xerxes, but if we're looking at Persian structures generally, we see Dartis and Artaphernes are promoted to positions um, and launch the Battle of Marathon. And we know little about these other than we're told they are related to Darius and the royal family. Clearly, as things pan out at Marathon, they're not the best decision makers. The decision to not use the cavalry is pretty flawed. In a direct contrast to this, though, if we look at something like Athens, we see their kind of democratic approach to leadership um, paying far more dividends, uh, that people are promoted to positions in part because they are often aristocratic, but because of the merit of their decisions. Um, so this is a nice comparison to Persian leadership, which basically seems more determined by who your dad is rather than whether you're any good at military strategy. But again, do be careful with using this as a solid piece of fact, because again, we're dealing with Greek sources who are going to promote various Greek perspectives. But again, to summarise, if we look at um, Xerxes being in charge, it seems there's no one underneath him, there's no kind of council that's actually willing to challenge his ideas and say, do you know what Xerxes, probably not the best idea. And in the few instances where he does receive this advice, he simply ignores them. Now if we take this idea of a systemic problem within the Persian leadership, within the Persian army, based around this idea of promotion through aristocracy um, we really see this come to the head and it really exposes this raw nerve when the two sides join in battle the persian tactic is clearly just to overwhelm any enemy be it greeks or otherwise with their numbers this has always been a persian advantage the sheer size of their army and particularly with the invasion in 480 xerxes brings with him the army of all asia um, clearly steamrolling his way through Greece, or that's his plan. But again, this idea of this army of all Asia with the God King at the head exposes more and more problems. One really striking issue with Persian strategy and Persian thinking is that despite the high regard given to Persian cavalry and the fact that this is one area where the Persians can completely outclass the Greeks at this time, throughout the conflict, we never actually see an effective plan to join up the cavalry and the infantry to tackle the Greeks. Um, they, they just don't seem to have the two bits working together. I mean, we see there's little or no instances of them actually being used at all. If we look carefully at Herodotus, there's very, very little reference to Persian cavalry being used in battle. I mean, with the reasons for this, I mean, we could suggest cavalry would probably not be very useful at the Battle of Thermopylae um, on the Narrow Pass, but surely at Marathon, that could have changed the tide of the battle. And it seems that they just have not learned from their mistakes. They have this great cavalry, but they just don't use them. And then we see a further problem with the Persian military structure that um, it seems whenever the kind of key leader or the main leader either runs away or is killed um, and the plan starts to run into some problems uh, the Persians simply seem to buckle it seems like there's no structure underneath these kind of key leaders to hold things together in the absence of a clear direction from Xerxes, Mardonius, whoever it may be Again, going back really early on, you've got a beautiful example at the Battle of Marathon, that as soon as the Persians start to become encircled, they don't have a, a counter plan. They can't effectively counter this or think about this. They simply buckle and run back to the ships where the Greeks slaughter them. Um, again, similar at Salamis, when Xerxes comes up with his ruse that he's going to escape once he does comes up with the ruse that he's going to relaunch the attack once it's clear that he's not there and Maldonius is trying to pick up the pieces the whole effectively the battle is over the Persians simply become fodder and finally again at the Battle of Plataea 
once we find out that Mardonius has been struck in the head by a rock from a Greek slinger, the battle ultimately is over. There seems to be no one really who can effectively step up. It's almost like there's no chain of command. It's all or nothing with the Persians in battle. It's either the core leader or no one. Um, it's a bit of an anachronistic comparison, but probably the closest. If we look at the kind of structure of the Persian army being reliant on this sole leader, if we make a, a comparison to someone like um, Alexander's campaigns against the Persians, where underneath Alexander, obviously he's the key leader, but underneath him you've got the companions, who are far more than friends. They are skilled military leaders, and each can act um, in isolation, um, they know what to do on a battlefield and they can act without necessarily instruction from Alexander, which is handy because he's usually at the front of any charge, a bit busy killing people. So, but with the 480 invasion, it seems that the Persians really don't have a structure underneath their core leader. Um, it seems all the Greeks really had to do in any of these conflicts was to set them back, was to defeat to deal with that one leader the person giving the instructions and as soon as they're out of the picture or as soon as they're in difficulty the whole thing buckles again though we must be wary that these are greek sources who describe the persians like this so if we're attributing the failure of the invasion in some part to the failure or the weakness of persian leadership the obvious flip side to the argument would be to look at greek leadership and what becomes clear from herodotus is this clear difference in greek military leadership and persian military leadership and particularly in battle it seems that all the way through the persian wars again bear in mind this is a greek source the greeks continually surpass and outdo the persians income in terms of military strategy uh, we get this notion that the greeks simply outthink the persians when it comes to battle they are thinking about the battle rather than piling everyone in and seeing what happens um, this idea that they are clearly militarily if nothing else or strategically smarter than the persians i mean this could be evidence of pro-greek sentiment but the way the battles play out really do help exemplify this idea that the Greeks were simply better leaders. Uh, if we start by looking at the structure of the Hellenic League, so we've looked at the structure of the Persian leadership, the structure of the Hellenic League is really kind of important to this, particularly with the willingness to kind of surrender position to strategy, as it were. Um, a really good example of this would be Eurybiades surrendering control of the fleet in both the battles of Artemisium and Salamis. This is quite poignant given that they are from two different city-states who do not get on, but in both instances, maybe with the help of a bribe by Artemisium, Eurybiades, the Spartan leader who is in charge of the navy, simply hands over strategy and control to Themistocles. Um, because he accepts that Themistocles has a better idea of what to do than he does. If we compare that to the Persians, you don't really have any example of Xerxes even admitting someone else has got a better idea than him. So this willingness to surrender position to effective strategy really helps the Greeks. It's almost like they are more willing to engage with different ideas. There's lots of examples, though, where this idea of strategy really is important, um, where the Greeks throughout, um, given that they're facing overwhelming enemy numbers, they have to think smart. They cannot simply rely on the sheer force of their army. So there's lots of good examples that pepper the sources for Greek strategy. A very early example and a great one to include it if you're looking at the wider scope of Persia, it's obviously not the 480 invasion, um, is Miltiades at Marathon. There's the discussion and debate over who should lead the battle once it comes to Miltiades, given the overwhelming numbers. 
um, we see the creation of that pincer movement that beautifully encircles the Persians with a much smaller Greek force. Uh, similarly, but also completely different, we, if we look at Thermopylae and Leonidas's choice of Thermopylae to fight, um, again shows their thinking clearly about how they're going to deal with the Persians. Also, his decision not to surrender, not to take a single step back, again shows a determination in the Greek strategy and the Greek leadership. Um, thinking about the bigger picture, yes, Leonidas sacrifices himself, there's the omen about a king will fall. But we cannot ignore the fact that he will realise that what the sacrifice at Thermopylae will do to motivate the other Greeks. And again, if we're looking at strategy, we cannot miss out Themistocles. He is the man with the plan throughout the majority of the Persian Wars. Um, he is responsible for some of the key battles. Obviously, at Artemisium, his decision to form into a Kyclo and disrupt the Persians is very important but then we get to Salamis and he pulls off one of the greatest military hustles of all time effectively telling Xerxes how to attack the Greeks um, fooling him uh, and basically pulling the rug out from under him I mean it's the one thing all military commanders want to do plan the enemy's moves in your favour and this is exactly what he does Similarly, at Plataea, Pausanias is very clear in his strategy about drawing the Persians across the Usurpus, about dividing them. So it's fair to say in all instances, right throughout the conflict, the Greek leadership is adaptive, it's resilient, it's thinking on so many different levels to the Persians. And realistically, leadership-wise, they are running rings around Xerxes and his mates. Now, our next big chunk, or next big reason for Persian failure is um, a pretty straightforward argument. Um, not necessarily one massively rooted in the sources. Here you can pull in your bits of archaeology, the surviving examples of armour. It's the comparison of the two different armies, the land forces. Um, and we get this notion that the lightly armoured, less well-trained Persian troops on a one-to-one -one basis simply are no match in this conflict for the heavily armed, well-trained Greek hoplites and this Greek style of close hand-to-hand -hand combat. And without going into masses of detail here about the specifics of the armour and the weaponry and so on, um, without going into too much detail, it's clear that this Greek way of warfare, the hoplites, the phalanx, the tight formations, was suited to fighting in Greece. And the Persian style of conflict with lightly armoured, fast moving troops fighting at a distance is more suited to fighting in Persia. A really good example of this um, would be that whilst missile weapons and wicker shields, you know, bow and arrows, wicker shields, may have been effective on the plains of Asia Minor and Persia um, against similarly lightly armed troops we are told that effectively they are less than useless against these heavily armoured Greeks who prefer to fight very close up. Throw into this mixture the seemingly superior Greek training, again be aware of Greek propaganda, um, and the prevalence of the phalanx. The Greeks seem to be much more skilled at uniformly moving as a body. Uh, they're far more skilled, it seems, at holding formation and using formation than the Persians. Again, you have this contrast between the kind of the Persian, almost like a mob, this kind of wild banshee army. Again, especially if we bear in mind the range of troops Xerxes brought with him, we see the Greeks are clearly more suited to fight in this type of conflict than the Persians. It should be worth pointing out here though that according to the sources and according to kind of modern scholars assessments of the Persian Wars we should remember that with him Xerxes arguably brought more Greek allies than he was fighting against but again as with cavalry as with all of these various different troops 
um, that Xerxes brings with him. We don't really get much mention of these Greek soldiers, these Greek mercenaries or allies fighting um, in any of the key battles. We seem to re be reverting straight back to hoplites versus immortals. Um, with the obvious exception of Plataea, where the Theban phalanx engages Athens, and we're told when this happens, the fighting is far more fierce, the two sides are more evenly matched. That's a good example of to illustrate just how different the styles of warfare were and how how much more effective and resilient the Greeks were against the immortals. Um, so yeah, we see this prevalence of the heavy armour and the skill in moving in unison on the battlefield clearly runs rings around the Persians. Again, if you throw into this mixture groups like the Spartans, um, who, as we know, are raised from basically birth to be soldiers, um, they are very skilled and very experienced and very well drilled in how to fight on a battlefield compared to kind of conscripted Persian troops. Um, there's a really good line when Herodotus is talking about the Battle of Thermopylae. He nicely sums it up where he ultimately says uh, the Persians were inexperienced soldiers who were pitted against men who understood war. Again, be wary of Greek propaganda and pro-Greek sentiment. But it's fair to say that in a lot of instances, yes, the Persians, the Persian army simply would not stand up to the Greeks and hence why they're reliant on huge numbers. But again, when in somewhere like Greece, where numbers are effectively limited because of the terrain, it's we cannot ignore the kind of the dominance of the Greek style of warfare in ultimately causing Xerxes' failure. For our next main cause, we leave the land and we head out to sea. And we need to look at Greek naval supremacy, or more realistically, Athenian naval supremacy. Again, if we go back to the accounts of what happens before the invasion, we're told that at one of these early meetings of the Hellenic League, the point is made that one of the big weaknesses the Greeks have is their lack of naval power. This is seen as a major concern for the League. They feel exposed. Following this, then we see this very rapid development, arguably potentially too rapid, um, of the Athenian navy. Again, we're back to Themistocles, his prophecy about wooden walls, and his intention to use the profits from the silver mine at Lorium to build this navy. Um, this is a significant achievement, uh, to build something so quick uh, is clearly a Herculean task, but it's not just the physical ships, it's the men who work on these things. Training and upskilling the people to be oarsmen, to fight as marines on decks. Um, so the rapid building of this brand new, brand spanking new Athenian navy is really significant. And again, it's new. It's All of these triremes are brand new, straight out of the box, shiny, top of the line, just been built. They are uniform, they work the same way, they're very very consistent and reliable. So that's a kind of key thing when the Athenians take on what arguably is a bit of a hodgepodge of a navy. Now Xerxes brings with him a large Ionian contingent but also some Egyptian ships and ships from elsewhere. So he's got this hodgepodge of a navy fighting against a uniform, disciplined, clearly structured, well-led force. And whenever the two forces clash, it's clear the Athenians outmatch their enemies. Their smaller, faster ships um, can run rings around these larger Persian vessels. They fight in narrow straits to reduce the Persian numbers, basically the Greek strategy on land and sea. But again, we're back to this idea of the ability of their leaders, particularly Themistocles, to effectively use these new weapons. Um, and we should point out that at this point in history, the nature of naval warfare is changing. We're moving very much from a system of boarding other ships to the dominance of the bronze ram 
on the front of the ship basically dodges at sea, which makes it far easier for the smaller, lighter Athenian ships to tackle these big, lumbering Persian beasts. Um, so again, the strategy is clear. It's an effective use of this very new weapon. The, the really good examples, obviously, are Artemisium and Salamis, where the Athenian navy, particularly, along with the other Greek forces, are simply able to outmaneuver, outsmart, and effectively outfight the Persians. And if we look at causes for Xerxes' failure, if he loses at sea, he basically loses at land. The thing that makes him flee the most is he does not want to be trapped in Greece. He does not want to be held hostage by the Greeks simply because he cannot cross the sea back to Persia because of the danger of the Persian navy. Um, apologies, I think I just said the danger of the Persian navy, obviously I meant the danger of the Athenian navy. Um, the Persian navy really wasn't much of a threat to Xerxes, well unless it's Artemisia in a bad mood. Anyway, leading on to our next massive chunk, it sort of ties in with what we've just said, um, we've got to look at the motivation of the two different sides. Again, although it's not necessarily explicitly covered in the sources or where it is, it can be speculative or um, certainly a bit too pro-Greek, especially if we look at something like Aeschylus. Um, it's the motivations of the different forces that need to be considered. Um, and propagandism aside, it would be fair to say that the large body of Xerxes' army of all Asia were conscripts either conscripts or people drafted into an army to simply bulk up numbers. They are there fighting because they were told to do so. Equally, if we're to believe Herodotus's lengthy and verbose descriptions of this army, talking about the Nubian contingents and troops from here, there and everywhere, um, this army is coming from very far-flung, Xerxes' army is coming from very far-flung corners of his empire, um, so we can also assume that they're even less cohesive, even less unified um, than if they were all simply Persian conscripts. Um, there's almost a lack of a core ideology other than to follow Xerxes and do what he says. Um, it's hard to try and draw up any kind of motivation for, again, if we look at Egyptian troops or the Nubian Ethiopian troops in Xerxes' army, it'd be very difficult to find a reasonable motivation for them to be willing to fight other than for their own glory, um, for the spoils of war, or simply because they have been told to. So we see basically an army of conscripts flung into a small part of the world that a lot of people really haven't experienced or no idea where it is they're flung into this world to invade it for the benefit of someone else the greeks however and again go bear in mind greek sentiment and this is a greek source the greeks however we see are fighting for their lands this is their their land um and they're clearly far more motivated to resist to fight arguably to the last um than the persians your really obvious example of this is the sacrifice of the Spartans and of course the Thespians and arguably the Thebans at Thermopylae. Um, even if we take this as a massive propaganda stunt on the part of Leonidas, this almost deliberate sacrifice to rile up the rest of the Greeks to set the bar very high in terms of not surrendering, fighting to the last to rid the land of the Persian invaders, it works. Um, it certainly motivates the rest of the Spartans, which is a big problem for Xerxes, but other Greeks um, who are keen to resist, this is their beacon of hope, this is their beacon of, look what the Spartans and Leonidas did, we've really got no excuse to not give it our all now. You could again extrapolate this idea of motivation even further when we look at the kind of particularly drilled back into the Spartans, this Spartan mentality regarding war. The idea that Spartans do not surrender, they do not return from battle, um, a battle that has been lost. We've got tons of great examples in particularly Plutarch's of sayings of Spartan women, of mothers killing their sons with a roof tile because they've come back from battle that they haven't won. It's their thing 
It's the Spartan thing to fight and die gloriously in battle, and surrendering is not an option. Um, we're not really told of a comparison with that in the Persian army, and yes, this is simply the Spartans, but if this is, if they're almost like... If we think of the Spartans as like almost like the cheerleaders or the kind of motivational coaches with the rest of the Greeks, it will drive on the others. Equally though, I mean, it's not just the Spartans. We see just as resolute determination from the Athenians. Prior to Salamis, their city is burned as they're forced to flee and watch their homes burn. Um, this plays into Xerxes' playbook, he thinks that once their homes are destroyed, the Athenians will give up, they've got nothing left to fight for. But it doesn't work. They flee to Salamis and they still fight with arguably more drive and tenacity um, because of what Xerxes has done to their homes. This dedication to, at that point it becomes almost revenge. Um, this is a kind of fierce tenacity and dedication that we've not we don't really see from the Persians. Um, again, at Salamis, you see Artemisia demonstrating the exact opposite. She leaves the battle halfway through. Clearly, um, the writing's on the wall as far as she can see. The loyalty to Xerxes is crumbling. And effectively, the majority of these troops we see are paid allies rather than clearly motivated um almost fanatical troops which is ultimately what the Greeks deploy on the battlefield. Their motivation is clearer, they fight harder and they are more resilient than the Persians. Now as we move on um, we're getting into the kind of the more, not necessarily obscure, but the less obvious reasons for um, Persian failure. It's unlikely that any of these would form the main argument of any answer you would write, um, but it's definitely worth covering in case these come up as given reasons in the interpretation. So we're going to look at what I've come together as logistics and terrain. So when we look at the issue of logistics and ter the terrain of Greece particularly, um, it's quite easy to get lost in vague statements as the sources really don't explicitly cover these but it is still a valid, valid point. Um, logistically, for Xerxes, invading Greece with such a vast army is an absolute nightmare. Um, it would have been, even though we're not told about the details of his organisation, why would we? It's Herodotus. If he doesn't do dense economic causality or assessment. Um, but yeah, moving this army is going to be a nightmare. We get an idea of this. Um, before he actually enters Greece properly. So we know that en route to Greece, um, for the 10 years between Marathon and Xerxes' final invasion in 480, we know that a lot of time, effort and resources have been put into building these vast supply dumps, um, almost like stopping points, all through Thrace and Macedonia to actually get his army well fed, well watered and well maintained to Greece before they actually even start fighting. Um, if you want another example, I mean the fact that he digs a canal through the Athos Peninsula simply so his navy can sail through without being damaged by storms, this gives you an idea of the vast logistical problems that Xerxes is facing. Um, once he reaches enemy territory though, uh, he doesn't have these, he doesn't have this support network, he doesn't have all the, this logistical structure beneath him. And effectively this means he doesn't have an effective way of sustaining this vast army. I mean, keeping them fed and supplied is going to be a huge issue. Certainly an army that's big, it's going to be incredibly difficult for them to bring all the supplies they need with them. This would be almost impossible. Um, and it's going to be a massive issue throughout. Ultimately, if he can't bring it with him, his army, like a lot of other armies at the time, certainly when Alexander invades Persia, he takes very limited resources with him. Ultimately, he's going to have to rely on taking resources from the states he captures or subdues. Um, this is obviously a bit of a gamble. Um, it's also not particularly well thought out 
plan because again even if he does capture and subdue the city states as he goes along without any real hassle it's unlikely these cities are going to have enough supplies enough resources to be able to feed this huge army um, whatever resources they do have or they can give is going to fall short of what is needed I mean, don't forget the Greek population at the time is significantly smaller than that of the Persian Empire. If we're to believe the exorbitant numbers, you could even argue that Xerxes' army was a greater population than Greece itself. We obviously don't have census data to know these things, but certainly the Greeks never ma managed to raise a huge army like this because they couldn't feed it. This problem of keeping his army fresh, supplied, fed... Um, is only going to be made worse if his, if his advance through Greece is delayed for a few days. Say, pesky little place like Thermopylae, every day the Persians failed to break through, every day they failed to advance beyond Thermopylae, simply meant that they would be burning through the supplies um, faster than they could take ground. Effectively, meaning that unless they made significant gains significantly quickly, unless they could establish a strong supply route by sea, his army may, poten may potentially fall into pieces through starvation or lack of resources. So the logistical problems of invading Greece with this enormous army were massive. And obviously once things start to go wrong, this backs up and you see real problems with his invasion and his advance. And again, apologies, I've lumped it in with logistics as well, but the terrain or the geography of Greece really makes his supply issues much worse. Greece geographically is very, very different to the broad plains of Persia and Asia Minor. Obviously, you've got the northern regions like Macedonia and Thessaly with these large flat plains, very fertile, good for wintering an army somewhere, which is what the Persians do. But they're not the ones he's fighting. Obviously, as he's re heading towards Athens and Sparta and the Peloponnese, he's going to go into this kind of very mountainous region of Greece. The mountainous landscape, the narrow roads, the pathways, this is going to be incredibly hard for his army to advance, but also for any supplies to be brought up to keep the front of his army going. Um, you don't advance with your supplies at the front, they're at the back and they have to be brought forward. And if you're trying to bring food for a few hundred thousand men up a narrow path, up a mountain, that's going to be difficult. But aside from the issue of supplies, at the same time we know that um, from battles such as Thermopylae, or Salamis or Artemisium, yet even at sea, uh, the geography of Greece has got it in for Xerxes, these valleys and mountains and narrow straits and passes make it impossible for him to use the full weight of his army or use his army to its full potential. So the geography fits nicely into the kind of Greek battle plan of small, dedicated forces blockading narrow passes like Salamis, like Thermopylae, where the Persians are forced to funnel into these narrow gaps. They have to go through these bottlenecks there's no way around that um so this the geography of greece really puts xerxes at a massive disadvantage and if that's not enough let's not forget that again according to herodotus the the terrain the geography of greece also decides to join in and stick with xerxes when he sends his mount men up mount parnassus to try and take delphi um we're given this grandiose description of what effectively really will have been a landslide um, probably because of the time of the year and the nature of this mountainous region a landslide with giant boulders engulfing the advancing Persian force and killing them outright or if you prefer Herodotus's other version that giant stone hoplites come out of the ground and just start you know smashing Persians left right and center but yeah the, the mountainous terrain the time of year he's invading um, landslides are going to be a problem for him and certainly it seems to be the case when he invaded Delphi so we've got the terrain being difficult to supply his forces difficult to fight in 
and then if nothing else the landscape fights back And last but not least, we need to address the issue of luck. Um, and to some extent, certainly for the Xerxes, bad luck. Um, the invasion of Greece on the part of Xerxes, if nothing else, this is a huge, huge gamble. Um, throw into this Xerxes' tendency for hubris. He is the classic character. He is the embodiment of hubris. This kind of massive confidence, this pride before a fall. Um, his belief in itself belief that it's obviously going to work why wouldn't it work um his bad luck really hits him hard so you've got this very big gamble stacked up against his own hubris and self-belief um so yeah the invasion of greece in the way that he does it is a massive gamble you know um it's easy to think of xerxes as a kind of gambler playing poker thinking he's got a solid hand. His hand is the army of all Asia. He's got soldiers from everywhere. He's got more men than the Greeks could muster in 10 years. Um, there he is, the gambler at the table, thinks he's got a great hand, um, and he puts all in. He bets everything he has. Um, again, if we look at kind of Aeschylus's description of the return to Persia obviously it's dramatic but there's always the emphasis and the idea that an entire generation of Persians has been lost um, the Persian casualties were huge uh, in this conflict so Xerxes is betting everything he's got he's betting the kitchen sink he's put in his gold watch he's betting the Egyptians and the Nubians and literally everything he has on what he thinks is a winning hand only to find out that the Greeks have got a better hand than him. Um, so it's a huge, huge gamble that he's built up. He's spent years preparing for. He's done everything, but it's a, it's a gamble nonetheless. At the same time, though, we've got to bear in mind some of the luck that the Greeks did enjoy. Um, certainly we can say that a greater damage was done to the Persian fleet by a storm on the way down to Athens than by... Themistocles' fleet at Artemisium so whether you count the weather as an instance of luck or just he should have checked the forecast more clearly you know luck plays its part at the same time again when they get when they get to Salamis it's a huge gamble that Themistocles takes think you know trying to bluff Xerxes into doing exactly what he wants luckily for him Xerxes does take the bait um and the rest is history but there's a huge degree of chance in that one example if Xerxes hadn't taken the bait Salamis could have ended up very very differently so bad luck for Xerxes good luck for the Greeks there is with all things like this there's a huge degree of chance that comes into play especially when if you look at Xerxes and we're back to this where we started with his poor leadership his inability to adapt and change strategy as is required. Um, once he comes across bad luck, that's it. The, the whole thing starts to crumble. Um, he either doggedly carries on or runs away in a panic. So in summary, I am going to be quick I am aware this video has gone on for quite a while I am aware that there are a lot of different reasons for the failure of Xerxes's campaign the advice would be to choose three good ones three that you think you can argue with some support with some length with some analysis um, and really focus on those like I said this is a prescribed debate so we've had I've tried to cover all possible bases um, ultimately you will be faced with a modern interpretation for the failure of Xerxes it may cover one or more of these different strands these different causes um, ultimately though you have to remember nothing ever happens in isolation you cannot say Xerxes's failure was simply down to his poor leadership or the stronger Greek leadership or another thing the key thing is to decide the combination and when we come to making judgments decide which you think was the main cause realistically 
what would you focus on as being the core reason for Xerxes' failure whilst acknowledging all of the others? So don't forget, Persian leadership, Greek leadership, hoplites and immortals, naval supremacy, um, logistics, terrain, luck, motivation. There's plenty to go at, um, and apologies if this has been very long. So, there you have it. Um, a lengthier than I would have liked uh, look at one of the prescribed debates, the reason for Persian defeat in 479. Um, hopefully this has been useful. Leave us a comment below, and until next time, goodbye.